Welcome to Vet Life Reimagined. Scott Edsett said the rules of improvisation apply beautifully to life. Never say no. You have to be interested to be interesting, and your job is to support your partners. That is beautiful, and I agree that it fits with our lives. Our guest today agrees that improv skills can translate over to veterinary medicine. Dr. Nico Grasopoulos started as a theater major. It's where he felt he belonged, but he always had a love for animals and worked in veterinary clinics as an assistant and CSR. He even had intentions going to veterinary school, which were distracted by a thriving business venture, but he found his way back and did end up going to vet school. How I discovered Dr. Nico was in an article that was written that described how he has combined many of his skills into teaching kids at a magical camp in Iowa. Let's get to the conversation with Dr. Nico Grisopoulos. When did you know you wanted to get into veterinary medicine? Well, like many people, I think I knew at an early age. I remembered for sure when I was about nine years old, I had probably been bugging my mom to get a dog for at least a year. She evaded it for one birthday by offering me a dog versus a Nintendo, and I chose the Nintendo, and then I bugged her for a whole full year after that again. And I remember walking into the Animal Humane uh, Society and seeing like seeing the dog that we ended up adopting a little yellow lab. And I just flew to the kennel, put my hand there and everybody who came by said, Nope, he's mine. And so my mom could go find somebody to, to get him. And that was my first start of a strong bond with an animal. We did everything together. And that's when I definitely knew that I wanted to become a veterinarian. Now it didn't necessarily happen in that order. I took a lot of different routes before becoming one as a kind of second career veterinarian myself. Yeah. Because I've been able to read a little bit about you. You did. You went down a very different path. You actually became a theater major, I believe. So what kind of got you interested into doing theater work? Yeah, well, in high school, um, you know, so as as part of my path and my story, I am married. My husband's name is McDean. We have two adopted children. But in the high school years of maybe not coming out as gay, a lot of other people knew before I did. <laughs> and and uh, in the sense of I already knew, but I hadn't really said it out loud. And so I found real comfort uh, in finding my family with the theater department at my uh, school. And so that's kind of where I spent a lot of my time. And I thought, you know, this this is kind of what I want to do. I was really enjoying it. Probably, you know, like yourself, you're on a podcast, so you, you like to publicly speak, but a lot of veterinarians don't necessarily like public speaking or even sometimes interactions with people, <laughs> but that's always been something that I've enjoyed. And so that was kind of the route I took. I still was interested in veterinary medicine, but I thought, you know, I think I, I'd have a lot more fun doing theater. So initially started my college career in theater, actually did still end up getting my theater degree my final year of theater, I thought, you know, I, I'm not someone that wants to go to Hollywood and uh, spend, you know, years eating ramen and trying to make it <laughs> and get my first break. That just didn't really appeal to me in the end. I still enjoyed the experience. And that's when I thought, you know, I really do want to go into veterinary medicine. So at the time, I uh, pursued my biology degree started working for veterinarians in the area. I lived in Chicago at the time and worked for an emergency clinic and had a lot of fun doing that. And then started another career that postponed till I actually got to vet med. Well, ironically, a couple episodes ago, we had a guest who is now a veterinary technician, but she started as a stage manager. So she shared how she saw similarities of being a stage manager into her role as a veterinary technician, especially in emergency and critical care. So from your perspective, have you seen any crossover, any skills that you learned with acting that have helped you be in veterinary medicine? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> In the role that I'm in now, I work for a pharma company, Zoetis. Many people are probably familiar with them, but this has allowed me to kind of combine that love of theater and public speaking with my love of biology and, and vet med veterinary medicine. So that's where that has helped. But I think in everyday practice, right, you are on the stage when you walk into an exam room. <laughs> so, you know, you, uh, you're you always publicly speaking, whether that's to a crowd or to an individual. And so that has really helped uh, as well. 
I also think one of the things I've even done with my sales team with Zoetis is we brought in an improv group to work with them. That's something I enjoyed when I was in theater doing improv. And so really thinking on your feet and coming up with ideas in the moment, uh, vet medicine is all about that. Yeah, I can see how that would be really helpful in vet school, (laughs) especially to to get your confidence, because I think that is a challenge. And I'll speak for myself, maybe not everybody, but one of the hardest parts of transitioning and even just, you know, going through vet school, there's still a lot of that imposter syndrome feeling. But when you leave the walls of the university and get out and into the real world, and all of a sudden you're, you know, you're supposed to be doing everything. I think being able to have some confidence and being able to listen and roll with the punches like improv can kind of help you learn. Oh goodness, that would have been a lifesaver, I think for me. (laughs) Yeah, it's also helped too. There's a lot of uh, parts of your theater training And I think a lot of people that get into theater have a creative background. And so in vet medicine, we're always getting creative to come up with solutions and think outside the box. It's also allowed my teaching style to be creative. So whether that's in this role or when I've worked in the hospital to try to keep it creative and fun, that is also where I've incorporated that too as well. Yeah. So did you primarily focus in small animal medicine when you got out of vet school? I did. Yep. Yeah. Going into school, like all of us probably had, I wanted to do everything. Like I said, this was a second career for me because I did after kind of working in emergency medicine as a technician and receptionist, I started walking some dogs on the side and thought I'd make a little extra money. And then in a year into that, that was a full blown business. So I ran a business for about 10 years where we focused in the North shore area of Chicago. It was a really successful business. I had about 20 workers, about 2000 customers, Uh, And it really sidetracked my path to vet medicine, but then went back and applied and sold that business and kind of got back into veterinary medicine. So, yeah. Okay. So you have improv skills, you have business skills, you're you're really (laughs) getting prepared to do veterinary medicine. So that is fascinating. What do you think was most successful for you? What was one of the big factors that helped you get so successful in the dog walking business? I really had a high expectation for quality of care. So I really, you know, the first year it was just me running it. And so there was a a lot of my reputation on the lines for when I eventually started hiring people. So that's where we had a high, high quality level. At the time, there really were not a lot of people had cell phones. So I would have my employees kind of call in when they got there, call in when they left. So I could see they were actually at the home for the full duration. We also had really good relationships with a lot of the hospitals in the area. For me, it was lucky that I ended up working at that emergency clinic because it was a location where a lot of doctors did some extra work to earn some extra money. So they'd work in the area at their regular Monday through Friday, but they'd come there to work a relief shift. So I got to know a lot of the doctors in the area and create those relationships. But the area that we were in was very affluent. And so we also had to really have a good name behind us. We were top rated on Angie's list. I was really specific about some things. So I wanted to also have that pet owner come home and and feel like they felt good about leaving. They didn't feel bad that they had left their dog or cat alone for that long period of, uh, periods of time. So we had handwritten notes for every visit. Uh, I even had my employees organize their mail by size because I felt if the owner came home and said they took care of my mail, they're definitely taking care of the animal. But it was all about relationships and having good people. Yeah. Oh, I love this little touches. It does make a huge difference. So Mm -hmm. it makes me think of like the hospitality industry where there's, it's a fantastic book. I'm going to draw a blank right this second, but he talks about running a hotel and the way they got so successful was the uh, tiny little details. And his phrase was, we are ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen. And it was that high level, every detail And that's what got him so successful. Sometimes we forget that our business is a service business. Did you take those skills when you were practicing in in clinic as well? What were some of the things that you are proud of that you did in, in the hospital setting? Yeah. I mean, so I was in practice for a number of years before coming into this position, although I still do once a month relief work. I definitely took that hospitality skills. That would probably be one of my big things was there was a lot of customer feedback that we had good relationships for sure. And we talked about that with our staff and training them too, to be able to provide good customer service too. 
So how did Zoetis win, win you over? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, as a student, I saw different people in uh, these types of roles and in industry roles. And I, I saw that opportunity that, that looked, you know, really a fun opportunity to be able to, like I said, publicly speak about science and really mesh my backgrounds a bit there. Uh, it's even uh, now that I'm in it, it's uh, you're able to utilize a lot of those skills in much different ways than I thought about. That background and creativity and theater really has allowed me to, when I educate others, have fun with it and really be able to lean into that. And also that improv moments at times being able to shift to as well um, and that flexibility. So uh, that's uh, the other portion of this role that kind of ties back to my background is the business aspect. So I go into a lot of hospitals where I'm there for the technical expertise, but I really do enjoy kind of helping them educate on how to do business because I see, we see a lot of veterinarians. They're fantastic veterinarians. Now the training for students involves a lot more business training with the VBMA, but back in the day, there, you know, a lot of our veterinarians, they're good business owners, but there are sometimes some areas where I'm like, oh, we can make a smarter choice there. And it's, it's kind of fun to go in and, and help them through their business, not only on their technical, but like your question, how did I get into Zoetis? Because I knew I wanted an industry role by the time I was able to apply for them. Most of these roles, you have to be in practice at least three, if not five or six more years. When I hit that point, I had a day a week that I would go to every industry website and see if there was an open position and apply when they opened. And they take a couple of years to get in. And that's kind of how I landed when this one opened up locally. I, so I've had to have that conversation with lots of people who reached out and ask, how do I get into industry? It's like, patients. It is more competitive in industry than it is in clinics, especially several years ago in the pandemic when, I mean, you could walk down the street and you could get hired. <laughs> it's just, a, it's a little bit different in the industry, but it's good to know that you already had your eye on that. In fact, I have actually met someone who, similarly to you, I think they had a class where they went through different career options and they had an industry vet come in. And he, as soon as he heard that person speak, he was like, yep, that's what I want to do. <laughs> so I'll be teaching my first class on that actually in a couple of months at the University of Minnesota. So yeah, they, and I know you've had that background in industry too. So that's, uh, you know, the pathway and how it's a little bit hard to get into. And I think the big thing that people need to know, if you, if one of your listeners or watchers or viewers are thinking about getting into industry, the people who are hiring want to make sure that you're not running away from something, that you're running towards something. So there's got to be a reason that you're getting into industry other than I want to get out of practice, right? And so whatever you uh, love to have done in, in your day-to-day -day practice, think about how that can translate to a love of teaching an industry. Do you like to teach every day? Do you like training new technicians? Uh, that can really translate to this role too as well. That's a very good point. And I think not only just to get a job in industry, but also for yourself personally, to double check with yourself. It's wh what am I looking for? What, what is the ideal future? And it doesn't mean you have to have it completely mapped out, but at least be able to verbalize some of the values and, and things that you're looking for because all jobs are going to have challenges. So if it is, I just wanna go somewhere that they let me do nothing and sit on a beach, like that's not industry. <laughs> there, there's going to be other things too. So really being able to define what you like about a particular job, I think not only will look good in your interview when you're talking to them, but it, it's, I think it's good for you personally when you're trying to decide the right career path for yourself. Yeah. And if you're interested in one of these roles, reach out to any of the industry veterinarians that may come into your clinic because you can kind of get a better understanding of what these roles actually entail. Uh, I think uh, probably people even, maybe even me prior to coming into this had a misconception of really the details of the, the travel and, and what you're doing to launch a new product and, and how you're helping people through adverse events. There's some skills that you have to have with problem solving. Yep, done that too. Um, <laughs> yeah. And you've also become really involved in your local, I think, a VMA as well, correct? 
I have. Yeah. I just got the honor and I'm very humbled by it. They are going to award me with the Outstanding Industry Award at our upcoming conference in a couple of weeks here because of my involvement, which is usually not given to a veterinarian. It's usually one of our other industry reps. And so I am quite involved in the VMA. I'm very passionate about the students. And so while you can be in, involved in your v- local state association in all different avenues, right? It doesn't necessarily have to be with students. That's kind of where I focus my time on both with the VMA and also with the alumni at the university. Yeah. I think that's so good to get involved. One, to be aware of what's going on, to have a voice of what's going on. So what have you found is some of the most rewarding parts of getting involved? Yeah. Well, one of the things that I probably spend the most time on is I'm part of our foundation kind of wing of the MVMA. Uh, I've sat on the foundation board for the past six years. My second term is kind of the longest you could be on that, and that just timed out. But I sit on also a subcommittee of that foundation where we actually have such a hand in naming the who gets the scholarships. So our uh, association does a really fantastic job with their fundraising, probably one of the better that I've seen with a lot of state VMAs. And it's all in part to a lot of our members. So we have a lot of good members that do donate and give back to the foundation. And there's not always that connection and buy-in from state membership to actually give back to the foundation and funding. But we also do a lot of big fundraising events throughout the year. But around December is when all of the applications are collected and given to the committee for the scholarship review. We award nearly about $180,000 in scholarships. Uh, We had 66 applicants this year, and there's about 23 uh, scholarships that we're able to award. There are some additional ones that the foundation does uh, strictly through them. It is a time-consuming process because this year was about 600 pages to read through. Some of those applicants cross over scholarships because they apply for more than one and trying to kind of rank and figure out who goes where. But it is so rewarding to read a lot of their essays. They are just so bright eyed. Some of them are doing amazing things already or even have done amazing things even before coming into vet school. Some of them are going through a lot of adversity and challenges that they've had throughout life. And it's just really inspiring to hear their stories. So that's probably the area that I, I have the most rewarding take from. So when you are looking to decide, which sounds really, really hard, what are you looking for? What are some of the things that you're trying to maybe encourage in in the profession? So every, everybody on this committee probably has their own ranking. So this isn't really a standard kind of set. So we all come in, actually, even during our uh, decisions, uh, we sometimes we're all very passionate about a specific applicant. And so we kind of fight for them. For me, I look for uh, a couple different things. So it depends on the scholarship itself. So there are specific rules. Some of them are named scholarships. And whoever kind of put that into that might have some guidelines that we have to kind of follow. A, I will look at where their need is, right? So, and they can't be a really poor applicant and have a high need for me to award them. But if they're an excellent candidate and there's a couple of them that are both excellent and they have a really high need uh, in terms of financial need, then that kind of ranks to my top. But I also look at uh, kind of their work ethic. Uh, There was one applicant recently that had a really low need, but had created his own business since he was like 10 years old uh, and had created such a fantastic business that he was able to save money to be able to pay for his DVM degree and was still planning, knew that even though he had low need, it was going to be coming up that he had a semester that he didn't realize would require a little bit higher need. So work ethic is really big for me to see because as you know, being a veterinarian, it's not an easy job. And so seeing that they're already setting themselves up for success there is fantastic. Not that extracurricular activity, I think is anywhere in parts of any of the scholarships. There's a couple for just VBMA that you have to have requirements there, but I like to see that leadership within there. I like to see that they're already giving back to their community of fellow peers. We have also community community outreach programs like most university students participate in. Our state, there is a local one that works with low income and homeless individuals to be able to give back once a month. And then another one that works with our many Indian reservation populations. And seeing these students give back to their community is also a big factor for me when I'm deciding to. Especially because when veterinarians can be part of their community, back to something you said earlier in that 
a lot of what we do. It is a service business, but it's also a relationship business. So if you can build good relationships with the people in your community, that's going to definitely help you be Mm -hmm. successful. You work with students on in lots of different universities. You're very well informed of the profession. So what are some of the things that that you're excited about for the future of the profession? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. I'm really excited about, I think this might scare some people, but really the change that our profession is going through. I think we're working through some rough spots when it comes to mental health, when it comes to the change of uh, diversity and inclusion in our profession. And so I'm excited that there's awareness around those things, that we're having more conversations and that we are looking to come up with solutions for. So that's one thing that we have offered through Zoetis. We've actually designed designed a compassion fatigue talk, which is more than telling you everyone's burnt out. It's also trying to give you some solutions and some tools to be able to work through that and have some awareness of why our brain does what it does in those situations. Uh, They are not home right now, but my daughters, uh, like I said earlier, we have two adopted daughters. They are African-American and I look around in the profession and there's not a lot of color in our profession. And so I'm excited that we are having more conversations, that we are doing more pipelining to increase diversity in our profession because that's very much needed. There's very much a lack of that. So those are some of the things that I'm excited about as we're moving forward in the profession. Yeah. Change can be hard, but change can be really good. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And again, especially if you can participate in some of those changes, like getting involved, knowing what's going on, giving some funds to sponsor students going through. So all of those things are really neat opportunities for us currently and as veterinarians to give back. So another thing that at least I think you're you're pretty passionate about is you love students, but you've mentioned your daughters. I, I think they were actually how you got involved in a particular camp. So you actually started working with even younger kids on learning more about science and especially understanding a little bit about working with animals. So that's actually how I found you was someone shared that this article that had been written about you where you combine your acting career as well as your knowledge of veterinary medicine and are participating in a camp where it's, it sounds Harry Potter themed, which I also loved. I was like, oh my goodness, that's like all the best things put together. So do you mind sharing a little bit about the story on how you found out about it, how you got involved? What are you liking about it? Yeah. Well, I mean, first I should say my daughters have been along for this veterinary journey for all of it. They were just babies when I started vet school. So it was fun to be able to demonstrate your passion for learning while they were growing up. But my theater background has come back into my life recently with this camp. Uh, One of my theater professors has been running this camp for nearly about 20 years. She lives in California, but actually flies back to a second home in Iowa every summer to be able to run this camp for two weeks at this specific kind of Girl Scout location. Uh, It is a Harry Potter themed camp. I even kind of disservice it by saying that because it is its own creation. (laughs) Got a background in that, but it's called Frogwarts instead of Hogwarts. All of the kids, I actually don't know any of their names for real because everybody goes by their wizard name or your professor name. And uh, for the past three years now, I have been the kind of care of magical creatures teacher, which has uh, been able to incorporate some of that veterinary medicine science and also my theater background in, in enjoying and teaching and being creative. The first year I was pretty nervous because I don't normally work with such young kids. It's anywhere from about third grade all the way up to high school. And they're usually divided into four age groups and you have to come up with a uh, two one-hour courses and for each of the age, age groups that can also have the same theme that can gap over those. But I've had a lot of fun being able to teach that. My first year I taught about about magical creatures. So we did a, a kind of a historical, uh, I had them work through some of these magical creatures that were recently discovered through science. And then we also talked a lot about conservation through that too as well. And then last year we translated how owls are. So owls in terms of are a big part 
part of, right, the Harry Potter world. They do a lot for wizards, but also birds are so closely related to their dinosaur ancestors. So we kind of related that to dragons. And so we dissected owl pellets. And then through discovery, we found a giant dragon pellet that we dissected to as well. There's a lot of storytelling at this camp. It's really hard to describe without being there, but there is an overarching drama that's happening throughout the whole week that they have to discover. These kids are really into it. It's uh, really fun to see them just kind of let loose and be themselves. And really, there's no electronics that are allowed. So they're really in the moment the entire time. So what kind of kids get attracted? I mean, I I see like any kid (laughs) would love, I would love this. I kind of look that age. Maybe I can sneak (laughs) in, but, (laughs) but does it attract, you know, like, theater people or science kids? Is is there a target audience that they're aiming for in these kids? Yeah, it's all over the place. So that's, I would say this past year was the first time that I really found the incorporation of veterinary medicine because there were a lot of students that started talking about wanting to be a veterinarian. And so you, there is a science crossover. There's definitely a lot of theater kids. You might turn a corner and see a group of six kids singing acapella um, just to have fun. So there's a lot of theater kids there too as well. But my daughter, only one of my daughters is brave enough to kind of go there. She's kind of into theater. I wouldn't say that's her entire background, but it brings it out of her. It lets her let loose actually. And kind of, cause the, the, I would say the whole week, these kids are almost in constant improv. Like it is just, they are living the story that's being told the entire week. So there's a, like I said, that overarching drama, there is a story that's happening the whole week that they're uncovering a mystery to, and they're doing that as teams. There's jump scares. I mean, kids are, are laughing and crying through it all like the whole week. So it really brings that out in them. It's a very diverse group. So it's a very safe space too, as well. So I think a lot of kids that might not necessarily feel safe at a normal summer camp feel like this is a second family for them. And a lot of these kids that go there, they like the high school kids, they have been going since they were in third grade. So they've grown up every year going into this camp and it does really feel like a second home and family for them. Yeah. I think we all need a our place (laughs) to feel like we belong. And and for some people, it could be veterinary medicine is you've worked so hard to get here. And we're, I've I've mentioned this a couple of times, I feel like this past week, we're we're a little big profession because we're pretty close. There's probably a few degrees between us knowing somebody who knows somebody. Mm -hmm. And, And so it can be your people, your place. For you, what do you find is kind of the most special thing about veterinary medicine? Hmm. That's a great question. I felt like when I was a practitioner, the thing that I found so special was the investigative work. I always felt like a detective and that was kind of fun within it. But I agree with you. I actually feel like it's the community. It is such a small group of people. It's amazing, especially in this role that I'm in now, you know, I'll talk to someone who knows somebody out in California that I know. And it is such a small community, despite being so many of us. That's uh, something I really highly enjoy about this profession. That actually happened recently, too. Had that same guest I was talking about, who was a stage manager, she mentioned that she had given a talk with uh, another veterinary technician, gave me her name. And I was like, well, she sounds amazing. I mean, let's connect. And ended up, she was a veterinary technician from Auburn who was there when I went through (laughs) veterinary school. So there you go. It really is a small world. And I think all the more reasons to build those relationships. I feel like I'm coming back to that because you never know. It is so important to build those relationships, especially within the profession, because whether you're looking for a different career, if you are uh, interested in getting into industry work, it it helps to know people (laughs) Mm -hmm. either to ask questions or have somebody vouch for you if if you're going through the process. So I, I think that's really beneficial. And it's usually not too hard to do because very rarely has anyone told me no if I asked to have, hey, I have a few questions about this. Do you mind sitting with me for 30 minutes? So I think it is, it's just a, a really special thing about this profession. And and the neat thing is there are so many different ways to live it out. And you're still a veterinarian. Even if you're in industry, you're still a veterinarian. So don't let somebody say, oh, when you were a veterinarian, you still are. You don't lose the title. <laughs> 
Anything else that you would offer as encouragement or recommendations? The first thing that comes into your mind for other people in the profession? Yeah, what we talked a little bit about earlier about kind of the the mental health and the well-being in our profession. And despite so many people being aware that it's an issue, I think a lot of people don't necessarily take the steps to recognize that it's an issue for them. There is the power in no. So set your boundaries and understand what your limits are so that you don't burn out. I've uh, had actually a couple of classmates that have already left the profession because of being burnt out. So within a decade's time span, seeing these really brilliant and creative people leaving our profession because they didn't really necessarily know where their limits were and when to say no. So I think that's important to have have some healthy kind of sets of standards for yourself. And find somebody who can help you say no. Mm -hmm. I Maybe it's just the type of people who are attracted to this industry. We want to please people. We're there to save animals, make people happy. And sometimes we put that before ourselves. So if you find a buddy that you can call and say, Hey, I need to say no. And they can help you say no. Mm -hmm. I think that's worth it too. Mm -hmm. Cause I do know it is hard, but it is, it's worth it. It, you can't help people if, if you are not in a good place. So that's one of the things too, we talk about in the compassion fatigue talk that we give is also recognizing, recognizing the signs of I hate even using the word burnout, because that's not all that leads to compassion fatigue. It's also secondary traumatic stress that we may be experiencing through even just what we hear is happening to someone else in our, our profession. But being able to recognize those signs too, as well is is also important. That's if you haven't necessarily taken a course in that area and mental well-being, if you thought that was going to be kind of silly because you thought it didn't pertain to you, I would highly recommend that you you seek that out. I would also look into if your state association provides any resources. So like in Minnesota, part of the membership includes, I think it's uh, seven free se uh, sessions with one of our local social workers that used to work with the university. She has her own business now and particularly focuses a lot on veterinary health professionals. And so your state association might have some opportunities to even be able to talk to someone if you need that. So all of that's important in terms of, of your mental health and well-being too. That's a great resource to know about. I know ABMA has a few, but being able to talk with a social worker and you don't have to wait until you're ready to leave the profession to talk to a social mm -hmm. worker. I spoke to a customer recently that actually took advantage of that opportunity, and she is a owner of the hospital. And not that I'm saying this can align with every state's HR and how you can conduct this, but she hired that social worker to come in. They shut down their hospital for an afternoon, and she said, you know what, no matter what you're feeling, every employee has to go and sit with them for half an hour and just talk with them and see where you're at. And that has really helped the culture of her hospital and also figuring out if a lot of times people aren't going to seek the help that they need, or even if you don't feel like you need help, even wanting to talk to someone. Yeah. Ooh, that's really nice. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, like you said, it that's bringing in one person that time when everybody could sit down and, and talk to somebody who is not their coworker or their boss, right? They had a safe place that they could talk to. You, you said it helped the culture of the clinic. Mm -hmm. So it helped people open up, feel better, and maybe feel safer back with the other people in the hospital mm -hmm. that people cared about them and they felt like their their thoughts and feelings were important. So they brought a third party so they could feel completely open and safe. So that, that really speaks volumes when the leader does that. Yeah. I do usually have a final few questions for you. The first question is, is there anything that people may get wrong about you? You know, I th uh, maybe as I age, I think that I used to be a completely extroverted person uh, and I think I come off as extremely extroverted and I am, but I am extroverted to a point. I feel like I'm now that a person who's a mixed extro extrovert, introverted person, I've reached my limit and then I need to go home after that. <laughs> um, I need to kind of uh, recharge uh, on my introverted side. I would think that maybe people think I'm the Energizer Bunny on, on my energy for extroversion uh, activities, but uh, there is a limit. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. That's a good one. Do you have any, well, we've already talked about acting, so that one is not uh, available, but do you have any other uh, skills or interests that people 
may not know about? You know, I, I, I do really love to reach to my extremely creative side. So I do like to sew and I do like to decorate. And there's a lot of areas of that maybe you wouldn't think of a veterinarian that I, I reach for. So very creative in, in that sense, too. I also highly enjoy gardening. So uh, if I could be any uh, one else or have any other career, I think I would be in forestry. I am very passionate about uh, trees and, and planting them and restoring our environment with uh, with trees. So that's something that uh, in, in my time off, we spend a lot of time at our cottage in Iowa. We have a little 12 acre uh, piece of land and I don't know where I find new spots to plant a tree every year, but I usually order like 30 or 40 trees and, and seedlings and, and try to find new spots for them every year. So very passionate around there. So that's probably something that, that people who are closest to me know about. I could talk quite a, a bit on. <laughs> Well, that makes sense then, because I think your professor name at the camp, <laughs> Frogwarts, is something in relation. I think it it's is. Coniferous Green? Coniferous You're green. right. Yeah. So yeah. Dr. Con <laughs> Coniferous Forest Green is my name there. <laughs> That's it. Perfect. Is there anything on your bucket list that you would like to do? Oh, both my husband and I would like to do a lot more traveling. We used to travel quite a bit before kids and we had a much bigger life before vet school. And now we've downgraded <laughs> quite a bit. We have both reduced our salaries coming into vet medicine. So that has uh, limited some travel, but we would love to travel more. That would go to other countries. We did get to go to Europe for our 20th anniversary a couple of years ago, but we would like to explore more of Europe. From my love of trees and passions of them, I have and my many books that I've read on Redwood, uh, trees. I've still never been to the Redwood Forest. So that would be definitely a big bucket list uh, item to be able to do uh, as well one day. That would be really cool. I have not gone either, but it looks amazing. So, yeah. and what is something you are most grateful for? That's a great question. I think I'm just most grateful to be able to have entered vet medicine at a later age and have been able to do that with family support too, as well. We had two kids under two years of age when we entered that. So that took, you know, a lot of support from a spouse, my husband, that was going to be at home with uh, two babies while I went back to graduate school. So really grateful for my family to be able to have been there and have supported that journey into vet medicine. It was a dream of mine, like uh, every veterinarian to become a veterinarian, but to be able to do that when I was already in my early thirties and going back to vet school was something I'm really grateful for. So I'm curious, because you, you said you were grateful going in a little bit later in life. What mm -hmm. do you think that was a benefit having it more of a second career than maybe going in right after undergrad? Yeah, well, a lot of those experiences I talked to you a little bit about earlier, like being a business owner, the learning aspect didn't come as easy, I think, as when I was younger. And so really having an appreciation for taking my time to learn, that was a big thing. But the business background, being a little bit more mature in life, my focus is were probably much different in my 30s as a student than it would have been in my early 20s. Another question, because you said you were about to start teaching a class on, is it different careers in veterinary medicine or specifically on being an industry veterinarian? Yeah. So the university reached out recently. They do a class on different careers in veterinary medicine. And so they were looking for uh, people in industry to teach a one-day course on being an industry veterinarian and what that means, what the role looks like, how do you get into it. And so I'll be teaching a, a one-day course on that. I have lots of classmates that are doing so many fantastic things in veterinary medicine that you probably wouldn't think of working at human poison control centers and being that resource. Even within this role, once you get into it, you might think that the only role for a veterinarian in, in industry is as a professional services veterinarian or that technical veterinarian. Being in this role, I'm able to see that there are veterinarians at Zoetis that are leading our marketing, that are working strictly with the education when it comes to pet owners or that to be that business to business kind of education. There are many veterinarians in the research and development side of things within the company. This role is partnered with an area business manager. So they focus on the sales side and the quota. And there are a couple of veterinarians that love that part of it. They love the financial part of veterinary medicine that have gone into that role. So there's many different roles, even within some of the industry partners that aren't just the technical services veterinarian. But it's pretty exciting to see people doing different things with their career and many ways that that astound me and amaze me every day. 